Good evening, and a very, very warm welcome to each and every one of you to St. Paul's as we continue our Autumn Forum series this year exploring how to change the world, and tonight focusing on generosity. My name is Mark Oakley, and it is my privilege to be chairing the series, and of course to welcome and introduce our speakers to you, which I will do in a moment. But for those of you who haven't been to one of our events before, let me quickly explain what happens. Uh, in a moment, David Lammy and Lucy Winkett will speak about the meaning of generosity in our world, in our communities and in our lives. And then the second half of the evening will be addressing your questions. And if you have a question, please at any stage of the evening, write it out on the back of your leaflet, hold it up to be collected. We'll collect them up through the evening until around 8.15. Please make sure the question is legible, make sure it's brief, and they'll all appear before me on my little screen, and then I'll be able to put your questions to the speakers. We're going to end promptly at 8.45, and books from the speakers in the series will be for sale afterwards here, and both David and Lucy will kindly sign copies of their books this evening. There'll also be a chance to donate as you leave this evening to Haga, a charity nominated by David, who is its patron. It's a local charity in his constituency, which does brilliant work finding positive solutions with people whose lives are affected by alcohol. It's also then a practical test at the end of the evening, of course, to see whether tonight's had any effect on your generosity. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speakers, both of whom I am privileged to say are friends. And so it's a real delight for me to be able to welcome them tonight. David Lammy is the Member of Parliament for Tottenham, one of five children brought up by a single mother in Tottenham. He won a chorister scholarship to the King's School in Peterborough, studied law at SOAS, and was the first black Briton to study for a master's in law at the Harvard Law School, a long way from working in Kentucky Fried Chicken, which he also did. Elected to Parliament then in 2000 at the age of 27, he served for nine years as a minister in the Labour government and is now an active backbench MP. He's the author of Out of the Ashes, Britain After the Riots, a study of the reasons behind those 2011 riots and what needs to be done to prevent them happening again. It's said that a politician is a person who, when they see light at the end of the tunnel, orders more tunnel. Well, not so with David. His passion for people lies very much at the heart of his politics, and his relentless, and I'll even say breathless, energy to translate his values into human lives and communities is quite remarkable, and you are very welcome. Lucy Winkett is the rector of St. James's Church, Piccadilly. Among the first women to be ordained in the Church of England, she was also, of course, the first woman priest here at St. Paul's Cathedral, where she served until 2010, and was, I know I say for everyone here, a transformative presence. She's a founding advisor for the public theology think tank Theos, a regular contributor to Radio 4's Thought for the Day, was commissioned by the Archbishop of Canterbury to write his recommended Lent book for 2010, Our Sound is Our Wound, Contemplative Listening in a Noisy World. And she writes and speaks and debates on a very wide range of issues. Archbishop Robert Runcie famously said that the Church of England was in danger of becoming a swimming pool where all the noise comes from the shallow end. Well, Lucy is the great corrective to that state of affairs. And to be very personal for a moment, any church that has Lucy Winkett as a priest is a church that I can still call home. 
Our two speakers tonight both have similar gifts. The ability to distill the serious from the secondary whilst also making you laugh. The skill of reframing questions while still making you feel secure enough to make the change. And the greatest gift of all of being able to keep authentic, level and generous when others are making your life difficult. They are two, I believe, very special people. Would you please welcome our speakers tonight? Wow. I've just heard my obituary. <laughs> This feels a really long, long way from the young ten year old that got on an inner city train for the first time. With my dad wearing a trilby hat and a sharp pinstripe suit, my mum wearing a beautiful floral number. It was 1982. We got on at King's Cross. We got off at Peterborough. And you come out of the train station at Peterborough, and there is this most enormous temple like building. Not the cathedral, but Queensgate Shopping Centre. <laughs> and you walk through it, and then there's the cathedral. And I was doing voice trials to be a cathedral chorister. Alid Jones had just got to number one in the charts. And the local priest, our local priest, and the local head teacher had got together and said, Look, we think David's got a voice, he should give this a go. Did the voice trial, got back on the train, came back to London, and a few weeks later we get an envelope. And I tell you, it was like a Billy Elliot moment. And I'd, I'd made it. And in a sense, whenever I'm in buildings as great as this, it takes me back to that first moment. And actually, there, and this is why I start in this place, there in Peterborough, and it wasn't always easy.、Uh, I was a long way from home. I was, I was a boarder, although I need to emphasize the school is a state school, and that's why Haringey Council said they would pay for it, because they were a very, very socialist council in the 1980s. Some of you may remember. But I start there because actually, what I found. Even in that tough time, even as the only black child in that environment for so many years was huge generosity. And I reflect that in my own life, I have always found those moments. Of generosity in others. So, my father arrived here in 1956. He arrived in Southampton. He had come from、uh, Guyana.、Uh, part of that Windrush generation. And he arrived obviously in a Britain where at that time, With six shillings in his pocket. Don't ask me what that was worth, I'm afraid. But I know it wasn't that much.、Um, he found, you know, they had this vision of England, as they would say. And of course, there was lots of hope and lots of opportunity, but it was a tough time. Britain coming out of the war, coming out of、um, rations. Tremendous change going on in British society. He wanted to be a pharmacist. He ended up a taxidermist. A mixture of prejudice and thwarted ambition, but nevertheless, 
But obviously, he spoke about part of the London that he experienced at that time, which was a London of, well, inscribed on so many of the houses that you wanted to get boarding in or indeed that you wanted where you wanted work. No blacks, no Irish, no dogs. And so I remember in his voice often plucking out the moments of generosity that he found along the way where people reached beyond their identity or what they thought was their identity to try and make a difference in his life and therefore in the life of his family. And I think that that is important as we have this discussion around generosity in this city of ours. And I think it's particularly important in any religious setting. At the moment in our country, we are having a very real debate about immigration. Let me tell you another story. I was in the last general election, and what happens when you're an MP like me, and you represent a so-called safe seat? I have to say, on election day, Tottenham does not feel safe. You get sent all over the country to help colleagues in marginal seats. So there I was, in West Leicestershire, just outside Derby, in a place called Colville, in the shopping centre, with Ross, the Labour candidate, holding balloons, saying, vote Labour. And of course, everyone in the shopping centre, passing by, tried their hardest to avoid us. But one young man with a four-year-old, we got talking. He supported Leicester. I supported Spurs. We talked about the weather. We talked about our children. And then I popped the question, not will you marry me? <laughs> How will you be voting? I'll be voting for BNP. BNP? But we've just had a conversation. It's those polls. I work in construction. I've got to feed my kids. They're undercutting. They're being paid less, doing the same job. I can't get work. Of course I'm voting for the BNP. I might say Gordon Brown got into a little trouble the following day on this subject with a Mrs. Duffy. But the point is, in this setting, I also want to say that in the midst of a very difficult discussion and debate around immigration, I think that a broadly Christian audience understands that the Jesus that I sung about as a chorister for so many years in Peterborough and that I still sing about on a Sunday morning is a Jesus that, like my father, was born in a place because people couldn't find, wouldn't let you in, had a death warrant on his name, was a refugee, and the perception was, at the time, that he was illegitimate. And so that is the starting point for me of any discussion of generosity, that particular story, and the way that you can really think about what that meant at that time in that period, and why compassion and empathy are very important human attributes that we need to revisit. So let me just cut to where I think and frame this discussion as a politician, where I think we find ourselves in the world at this time, in our country, in developing, uh, in developed countries. There have been two revolutions that have happened over the last few years, really, since that period when my father arrived here in the 1950s. And I look at this audience and I can see many, many youthful faces 
but I think people will recognize these two mini revolutions that we take for granted but were massive and huge. The first is the 1960s social liberal revolution. The revolution that brings me here as the son of West Indian immigrants. The revolution that brings as many women to this audience, if not more than men. The revolution that means that we had a very protracted discussion in Parliament a few months, months ago about same-sex marriage. It's the rights revolution. The revolution that actually starts earlier in the centuries, the birth of my party, that's about self-actualizing, how you can be who you want to be in the 20th century, the first century, where effectively we say that powerfully as a notion. Social liberal revolution of the 1960s, not just about miniskirts and the Lulu period, much more than that. Then you get the second revolution, another liberal revolution, the economic liberal revolution of the 1980s, best personified by Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher. And let me just say on Margaret Thatcher, who obviously um, died this year, I, I stood up in Parliament to pay tribute to our former Prime Minister. And, you know, some Labour people didn't want to say anything. Some, some said quite a lot. I think of Glenda Jackson in Hampstead. What I said was this, that there were the decisions made under, under her that had a deep effect on folk in Tottenham and on the community that I'm from. And I, at the time, felt that the way that things were executed uh, was, sh was, was shrill and tough and uncompromising. But I did pay tribute to Margaret Thatcher's conviction. Because you see, in politics today, now that I've been in the game for over 13 years, I need to tell you that there's not enough conviction. Sometimes, I mean, this is the way with life, you know, you meet people and they don't really know their own minds. It, it, their minds seem conditioned by the last person they spoke to. Well, that conviction is important, but nevertheless, it, it, it was at the centre of that second liberal revolution. So two liberal revolutions, 1960s, 1980s, liberal being the key word here. Freedom. Freedom to be who you want and freedom to make as much money as you want. Where is the generosity within that? Because you see, there is something that connects the my right culture my right to that pair of trainers, which is what I saw during the riots. You smash the shop window, you help yourself. My right for MPs to have that duck house on the taxpayer. My right, if you're a journalist, to listen to your voicemails. My right, if you're a banker, to have that two million bonus. Where does that get us to if we don't have alongside that responsibility? and a sense of virtue and responsibility that comes from empathy, that gets you to that charity, that love, that compassion, that generosity. And so I think that we have become a very hyper-individualized culture. And ironically, if you want to make this political, what happens is that both the left and the right collide with their two liberal revolutions, potentially to make us a very shrill, 
isolated, individualized culture in which the generosity gets shut out. Now look, when I was a minister under Tony Blair, at the beginning of that government, there'd been a lot, obviously, a sense that the NHS was not what it needed to be, that schools had leaky roofs, that our train service, despite all the discussion about HS2, was not what it should be. And there was a lot of investment in the state. But we also found ourselves really committed to targets, to indicators, to performance standards. We'd slap a target on anything. You know, it, we had more crime legislation in 13 years than the previous 100 years. I look back and I say, we, we almost tried to socialize the state, every single pocket of our lives. But of course, I think when we talk about generosity, we're also saying this is not just about the state. It is about the individual. And where is the space to be in empathy and compassion with someone else? And I don't think, I don't think that you know, there's some, a lot said at the moment about social media. And social media is great. Twitter, Facebook, the ability to relate to what's going on in the world because you can see it before your eyes and feel connected to it. But in a sense, there's an old-fashioned word that's got lost. Solidarity. And I think solidarity conveys a kind of action and also a sense that you, that the thing you are in solidarity with may be a long way from your experience. When I was young and getting into politics and got swept up by movements like CND and anti-apartheid, in some senses, both of those causes had some relationship, but were also very far removed from my experience and many of the people that I joined in solidarity with. And I think that, in a sense, here in this city, part of what we need to do is eke out more of that space where we come together understanding that, yes, these two revolutions may have made our country and our society fairer, more tolerant, maybe even more prosperous. But somehow we've lost quite a lot along the way. And we need to put that back. In that sense, I would agree with the Prime Minister about a big society, but I want the society to be a bit bigger. There in the workplace. There because there is some social construct called the state, and sometimes things do need a bit of funding. There, because we're also very clear about where the market ends and where society, community, and families begin. That's the other thing I would reflect on as a politician. Sometimes we would talk about family. We'd say things like, we've lifted 100,000 kids out of poverty. My sense is that parents lift children out of poverty, actually. Often supported by the nursery and the school, but parents do it. Let's get family back in that if we are to really think about being in solidarity with others. Here in this city, I'm afraid it is still the case that the poorer you are, the more you give. And at a time when those who are wealthiest in our society have done so well, I worry that some of the philanthropy of the past does not feel as present. You know, I think of the great movement to create libraries in our country. In so many towns and cities, you can see this wonderful edifice, the university on the high street for everyone. And you see names like Carnegie and others who've given so much. And I wonder, where are those edifices today from those who have done so well? Where is that charity today? And then I reflect on the food bank movement and the food bank I was in in my own constituency a few weeks ago. And I think about 
those who have so little, walking up from Lidl's to hand in that food for those who have nothing. And that kind of generosity, sad that it's required in the fifth richest economy in the world, but nevertheless, a sense that the poorer you are, the more you give. I also, just ending here, because charity and generosity is something I saw this weekend as I reopened my local mosque. Two million building, vast, impressive, rooms for young people and students, as well as new prayer halls to pray. All of the money coming from local people. Many giving their labour and time to make the building happen. That's why it cost two million. If it had been a government contract, it would have cost 15. Wow, what generosity there in that small community in North London. So, to provoke the audience, I've sought to frame what I think is happening in our country. Of course, it's for the political class to respond to that. And let me just say that there must be a burden on all three party leaders, whether David Cameron, Nick Clegg or Ed Miliband, to really demonstrate they get it. And I say this because if you're young in our country, the settlement's so fundamentally different. No free education, no full employment. If you've got a pension and you've got a job, you're probably working way past 70. Can't buy your own home, not in this city, not unless you've got a deposit, the average deposit in London, £100,000. You need to demonstrate, I say to all three of them, that you get it, because that PPE from Oxford, and then you went to work as a researcher for a party leader, and then you inherited a party, some might say, feels quite far removed from their experience. So frame, framing the issue recognises there are, that there are pockets of generosity, but in our hyper-individualised country, and sometimes in this city, eking out this space for a renewal of empathy, compassion and generosity, thinking about the very cornerstone of our faith, I think is hugely important. And that's why I welcome the opportunity to be in discussion with you here in St. Paul's this evening. Thank you very much. As Mark said uh, in his introduction at the beginning, I used to be here, I used to work here, and was here for about 12 years. So it's, uh, it's always a rather complicated thing to come back to what I used to call, in my most difficult moments, the Pleasure Dome. <laughs> it's lovely to be underneath the Pleasure Dome again. Generosity is a current subject, as we've just been hearing. Just last week, the Archbishop of Canterbury urged the energy companies to be generous. Gas and electricity we need for heating and for cooking. They're necessary for our lives. Therefore, the social obligations of energy companies, he said, is high. And they should be, in his word, generous, not just concerned with the bottom line. As the advertising for this series suggests, the original sense of the word generous in Middle English is nobility of birth and of spirit. It suggests that we're generous with what we have, that we give of what we have. One contribution that Christian theology has made to our understanding of generosity and our character as human beings is that we exist in the world as human beings as primarily receivers of gifts. That's one of the fundamental aspects of our nature as human beings. We receive the astonishing gift of life itself. We didn't ask or deserve somehow to be born. We receive the gift of time. If we're lucky, we receive the gift of love and of friendship. All that we've received and not earned 
In Christian theology, we only love because God loved us first. All of our life, therefore, is characterized, the hallmark of our lives in the world is a response first, within which we then take initiatives. And so we live in the context of divine generosity. We are showered with gifts of life and of time. Generosity becomes, therefore, not so much a choice we make to be nice to someone else or to sign a check. Generosity becomes the element in which we flourish, like air. We are born to breathe in the generous presence of God in order to live. And however often we breathe out again, the next breath is another gift that showers on us more minutes, more hours, more years in which to live. At the heart of any discussion about generosity, philosophically and theologically then, is the notion of gift, freely given, and in the light of receiving, we give in return. But it's not just a reciprocity that characterizes generosity, I want to suggest. Again, from a Christian starting point, God has given life, but if human beings are trying to match that generosity, we simply won't succeed. And that's where we come to the problem of generosity, particularly in a religious context, particularly if you identify yourself as a Christian or as a member of a faith. Generosity is somehow an imperative, and it becomes a burden. It could become something that simply engenders guilt and not a little paralysis when you simply don't want to be generous. Going back to the etymology then of generous, noble-minded, it can feel rather too earnest, rather too high-minded, dispensing largesse from your bounty to others whose need is clearly more obvious than yours. It's not that generosity that I believe, in the words of the title of this series, could change the world. It's not that generosity that changed the world. A little generosity from those who have a lot of power and a lot of money and a lot of influence is in fact the reverse of changing the world. It's a reinforcing influence on systems that are unjust, unequal, and at times abusive. In a political or a social sense, I want to suggest that occasional and unpredictable acts of generosity can simply keep those below you indebted and insecure, unsure, disempowered, rather than encouraged to act similarly. So although generosity doesn't, I think, demand reciprocity. It does demand mutuality. Living generously means knowing how to receive as well as how to give. It takes courage to receive kindness, money, time, advice, or help. It takes courage to receive because in receiving, you're admitting your need. I was outside Tesco's a few weeks ago. My local Tesco is at Piccadilly Circus. It was Monday evening. I heard a shout behind me, my name, Lucy, and I turned back with my bags to see a man I barely recognized flinging himself through the traffic on his bike. I say I barely recognized him because since I've been at the church where I am now, the times I've seen him, he has had matted hair, a Ben Gunn beard, a desperate and dangerous sore on his leg. Often his clothes were stinking. He was not often able to hold a conversation because he was so out of it on drugs. And he slept every day during the day in the pews of the church, and he would be asleep on the threshold of the church door every morning. He'd been sleeping outside on the streets of London with no home for about 20 years. One day, and he's still not quite sure how it happened, With a combination of years behind him of suffering and isolation and a stay in hospital because of his leg, he decided to see if he could change his world. Rehab has been almost impossible. He himself says that he's been in hell. But outside Tesco's on Monday night, his beard was trimmed, his eyes were gentle, he tied a bunch of rosemary to the crossbar of his bike to give him something beautiful to look at as he cycled about, and he's taking it one day at a time. 
while he was suffering for those years, his characteristic response to being offered help was hopelessness, some aggression, and despair. But I know that I've received from him a huge gift. He has a truly generous spirit. And even in those years of suffering, he is somehow free. His need was on the outside of him, unlike most of us whose needs we keep hidden on the inside of us. And he had the courage to receive the help he was offered. He is one of the most generous spirits I've ever met, and every conversation I have with him leaves me more alive than I was before. Having courage to receive, then, is linked to being willing to give. Sometimes it can feel as if it's a zero sum. There's only so much generosity to go around. But in my experience, living generously is contagious. We're relational animals. If we witness generosity in someone else, it gives us strength and builds capacity in us to live generously ourselves. As I mentioned at the beginning, it does seem that public discussion of generosity is alive and well, although it often gets relegated to quirky items on lifestyle shows. There's a segment in Radio 4's weekend magazine program, Saturday Live, where people say thank you to strangers who've acted generously towards them, sometimes years before. And in the Metro newspaper, you'll have seen the column where people can similarly thank strangers for handing in, usually, their lost iPad or paying for their ticket when they were next in the queue. The phrase, random acts of kindness, has become a cliché, and stories of drive-in McDonald's or Burger King, where drivers pay not only for their own food, but for the food of the person behind them, are now quite common. Only this week, it was reported that in one branch of, and I love the name of this outlet, Heavenly Donuts, in Massachusetts, 55 cars in a row all paid for the donuts of the car behind them. <laughs> it became a goodwill chain. Sociologists are not quite sure what to say about this, unsurprisingly, except perhaps that it's a statement that individuals can protest against or resist the overarching news feeds of seemingly relentless bad news. Do these ways of living really help to change the world? Well, they can't hurt. But again, individual acts can be not so much world-changing as more like acting as a chaplain to the status quo if they remain individual acts, and somehow if they absolve the doer from the underpinning injustices with which we live and which we've often stopped seeing. Generous living is not separate from the other themes in this series, compassion, living together, freedom. And generous living is world-changing in the context of cultivating other values, such as trust, integrity, and forgiveness. I suppose one thing I do want to say about living generously is that I think it's anarchic. Generosity is anarchic in that it often just doesn't make any sense. On an individual level, given our character as economically active individuals in a competitive system, generosity can play havoc with our expectations of reciprocity and patterns of relationship that depend on contract and exchange. Does true generosity require that no self-interest is involved? I don't think so because that seems to me to assume, as I said earlier, that there's only so much generosity to go around. The truth is, it's limitless. Nothing is out of reach, and nothing is impossible. Generosity of mind might mean that on question time, one of the panelists might say, hmm, that's a really good point, I hadn't thought of it. I've changed my mind, thanks. No chance. <laughs> Looking forward to seeing you on Question Time soon, David. Generosity of spirit might mean that in the words of the French phrase, to know all is to forgive all. A generous spirit recognizes the struggle of daily living in ourselves and is therefore 
perhaps more likely to reach out to someone else. Generosity as a concept provokes reflection on the notion of enough. What is enough? How is enough measured so that I know how to give? A helpful trick in this regard is to imagine your life as it is now, but where money is completely unlimited. Not just that you've won the lottery, but that the money is unlimited. How would you live? Would you work? And if so, what would you do? As much money as you spent, more would be available, so there's no limits on your choices. It's a device in order to discover what you believe is enough and what you believe is a good way to live. Generosity requires a level of imagination and empathy to walk in someone else's shoes and to act with that knowledge in mind. It also requires some confidence. If we want to live our lives giving of ourselves, then we must have a self to give. At Stanford University this year, some experiments were devised in order to discover the link between what we experience in the virtual world and how we act in the real world. In one experiment, the subjects put on virtual reality goggles and they were dropped into an evacuated city. One uh, group of people were told that they had superhuman powers. They could fly like Superman and they had to deliver a shot of insulin to a diabetic child who was stranded somewhere nearby. You lift your arms above your head to fly and rotate your body to go in another direction, just like Superman in the movies. Another group of participants were taken on a tourist helicopter ride around the city instead. Once the game was over, the participants sat through an interview that they were told was not part of the experiment. And halfway through the meeting, the researcher would knock over a pot of pens on a desk. The group who'd been given superhuman powers in the virtual world rushed to help clean up the mess much more often than those who had not, many of whom did nothing at all. The findings suggest that the more empowered people feel, the greater their propensity capacity for generosity to others. Perhaps that's a link to the rights culture that David was talking about. Empowered people, even with imaginary superpowers, have greater capacity and opportunity to act generously. To widen the set of questions, finally, what does an education system look like that focuses not only on the maximizing of a student's earning potential when they leave, but encourages a generous use of time, money, and relationships explicitly as a vital aspect of being human. What does generosity look like in the criminal justice system? I don't think it means that there's no punishment or no consequence to crime, but it might have consequences for staffing levels in prisons, the balance between punishment and rehabilitation, the issue of overcrowding and moving prisoners every few weeks so that no formative relationships can be developed. What does a generous institution look like, not just an individual? For example, a church, or a school, or a hospital, or a business. Perhaps it is one where the spirit is not crushed by the letter, where employees, or patients, or students, or prisoners are still human beings. And this doesn't have to be too earnest, poverty-stricken, keeping it real ethic. One business where this generosity of spirit seems to me to be alive is in the innocent company who make the smoothies, soups and juices. Their West London offices have grass on the floor, bean bags, pub tables, table football and table tennis available for staff to play during work hours. Their brand globally is worth £76 million. Their workers work in an atmosphere that is generous and playful. Living generously requires a good memory of our own mistakes and our own shortcomings, which increases our empathy for others and our desire or will to act generously towards them. Generosity is the lifestyle of a free person, refusing to diminish or dehumanize another. Finally, 
The story of the Good Samaritan is perhaps the most famous story in the New Testament about generosity. We imagine ourselves into this situation. We see the man on the road. We've got things to do. We're busy. We're in a hurry. Perhaps we don't want to get involved. Martin Luther King Jr. said this. The question we ask ourselves as we look at the man lying injured on the road is, what will happen to me if I stop and help him? But the better question is, the generous question, what will happen to him if I don't? Thank you. Thank you. So thank you, David and Lucy. And now is the time, please, for you to think of your questions, to write them down, to hold them up high in the air so they can be collected and rounded up and sent through to me. They are starting to come through. Um, just while that's happening, David, uh, you talk, as you do in your book, about the two revolutions. And also I saw an article you wrote for your local paper where you talked about the culture that's around uh, in Tottenham and of course in other places. Uh, you called it a culture that glamorizes violence, a consumer culture fixated on the brands we wear, and a gang culture with warped notions of loyalty, respect and honor. How in this culture and in the wake of these revolutions can we begin to make generosity plausible? How do we develop imaginative awareness to make this a plausible thing? Or is it always going to be anarchic? Um, what well, social policies, for there, instance? There, there's, all, there's a paradox at the centre of this. Um, the riots is juxtaposed with the Olympics the following year. Two very, very different visions of our country. As we were being reminded of the Good Samaritan, I was reminded of the image of the young man during the riots. He was, I think he was Malaysian, but he was from, from certainly not from, from, from London. He was here as a student, um, thrown to the ground, beaten, um, phone stolen. And then the, the group that are, are rang him, the gang, move off. You then see some other young people pick him up and your heart lifts looking at the CTV, CCTV in the hope that they're about to help him. And unfortunately, they go into his bag and help themselves to what's left and move on. And I think that that is a stark and very depressing image of what I talked about in that article. But you see, at the same time, during those very same riots, in my constituency, I saw in one of the most deprived constituencies in London, people with bucket loads of nappies, clothes, house goods, brought to our local leisure center to support the families uh, who had been burnt out of their homes in the union building that burnt to the ground in Tottenham. And I, and I know I saw that very same generosity in Croydon. So there is also a paradox. As we speak about those who are on the streets, and let me just say, sometimes in our culture, in our society, in the media, we try to make things feel better. So we tend to talk about the riots as if it was all young people rioting, and I'm afraid it was absolutely not. There were adults helping themselves to other people's goods, which is much harder to get your head around. But even when we think of that, we must remember that yes, there may have been 600 young people on the streets of Croydon, or young people and older people on the streets of Croydon and Tottenham and Ealing and Clapham, but 99.9% of the folk in my community were at home. And 99.9% .9 of the young people were at home. That's hope. Something's going right. 
And so we've got to latch on to what's going right. And we do, I think, need to revisit notions of character, virtue, how that is built, how you build that, and how we don't become over-instrumental. So schooling is not just about grades. It's about what you learn along the way, how you develop your ability to empathize and feel compassion. And just on this just brief thing that, that I think is worrying in our society, if you have young children, uh, my children are seven and five, you start around five, four, five, and I don't know if there are any psychologists in the audience, but to recognize that they understand, and I understand it's a very primitive emotion, shame. <laughs> they do something wrong and they hide their face when they get told off. <laughs> it's that beginning of understanding your role in a community. The worrying thing about where we've got to is that so many people seem to have no shame. Can you just, on, on plausibility, how we, I mean, I remember Michael Sheen, who, who, the actor who said that he often cried when he saw generosity, and he said, I think it's because I see people reconnect and we're so alienated now, we feel quite alone, and generosity is when I see connection and it touches me. How, and, and I take your point about mutuality. Mm. How are we going to make this plausible beyond the sermon? Mm. I mean, I, I think that there's, a, there's always a balance, isn't there, between, and particularly in, in institutions or groups of people who want to build community, who want to foster trust, cultivate wisdom, and, you know, in that I would hope the church might be included. Uh, in those kinds of ways of building relationship it's simply it's simply modeling it but actually it's not enough anymore i don't think simply to live it we have to find a way to communicate it so that it becomes something that is um not it is not so unusual i, I mean i was joking about the heavenly donuts thing but i mean there's a and there was a famous film made about it but there is something contagious about those um about those actions or about living generously. So I think it does matter how, what, the, what the language is around these, uh, these kinds of acts, that it's not seen to be a kind of quirky uh, side issue, but that it could be seen as a, as a much broader movement of cultural resistance to the kinds of themes that David is talking about, where education is reduced only to your grades, or where I was talking about the prison system, where prisons are moved around so fast in terms of uh, making prisons more efficient, that no lasting relationships are built. So the uh, balance between punishment and rehabilitation seems to be out of kilter. Mm, thank you. Right, thank you for your questions, which are coming uh, through very well now. Um, so let's start. Is there a danger that generosity can seem no more than a sticking plaster in the context of global issues? How can generosity bring about change in major conflicts such as Syria? Sticking plaster, Lucy. Mm. Uh, all the questions are coming through here. All the questions can't be asked. I'm trying to condense them into one. Um, I, I think that there is a, I mean, generosity is not a, it, it's, it's one among many uh, values to foster, but I think that generosity requires such a level of imagination that it is uh, an essential element in peacemaking. So that if, if uh, an individual is, di is different from me sufficiently that we find ourselves in conflict with one another. One of the main ways in which peace is made, it seems to me, is by cultivating the gift of imagination and empathy to be able to understand the, the viewpoint of that uh, enemy, to understand my enemy. And of course, you know, in the Christian tradition, we're called to love our enemies, to pray for those who persecute us. And that's an incredibly difficult um, thing to even begin to talk about, particularly uh, if, you, if you have been very hurt. So on an individual level, I think that there is that, uh, that uh, necessity for imagination so that generosity becomes an element in a wider and broader uh, peacemaking. But in those kinds of terms, you need, uh, 
you, you need people, individuals in those situations who are prepared to use new language, to break rules, to use that imagination and resolutely refuse to give in to the demonization and stereotyping that makes those conflicts in the first place. Is generosity a sticking plaster? I mean, when it comes to... I think generosity can be, can be very big. And, 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 and let me... You, you raised Syria. Let me, let me just say... Um, I think back to those who were very angry, upset, enraged, marched against the Iraq war. And... I, as a politician, would find myself in situations where I encountered a kind of rage. But sometimes, occasionally, someone would say, we marched and no one listened. And I have to say, as a, as a, as a Christian, and perhaps informed by the experience of racism in the world, I found that a peculiar thing to say, because patience is also a key component of how long change can take. I come up to date. I was coming back from Holland with my wife to the debate on Syria. And I remember turning to Nicola and saying, there is no boop way I'm going to vote for bombing Syria. And collectively, you, the House of Commons, across the House, converged into this place, influenced in part by those who marched in a previous war. We make a decision. That sends shockwaves into the system. And the most powerful man in the world finds an opportunity <laughs> to also do a little U-turn, <laughs> puts it to his Congress, and we get no war. Generosity works in peculiar ways, but sometimes you have to be patient about that. And none of us can understand the will of God, if you like. Now, you've talked about Parliament. There are four questions here which are around the same theme, and let me just read them to you. Um, are politicians in a position to foster generosity or do they take their cues from the public's attitude to generosity? Um, how can we be generous while challenging the status quo, not holding up entrenched systems of inequality? And when will the political parties adopt policies that extend generosity beyond the squeezed middle and hard-working families to the poor and dispossessed? So there's, a, there's a, a theme here about politicians and about generosity. The final question, all the political parties are committed to cutting welfare and immigration. What hope is there for a generous policies in Parliament? Now, lots of <laughs> themes there, but about, about politicians, can they really be generous? Or is it talk? Are they just actually looking for votes at the end of the day? you've probably worked out that I'm not very good at answering questions briefly. Um, on the politician, I think that we're living in a society that is not generous enough, this is controversial, to those that decide and commit to public life through politics. So first and foremost, I am a representative. I represent the people of Tottenham in the House of Commons. And the great thing about our system is that, you know, all of us come together from all parts of the United Kingdom, representing and bringing to bear the views of our constituents. And actually, all of us sit doing our advice surgeries. I sit in my local Citizens Advice Bureau on a Friday night, and believe me, I see 80 or 90 people who, who have tremendous challenges often that are coming to see me. David Cameron sits in Whitney Town Hall or wherever it is. He doesn't do it every Friday, I suspect, but he, will, he does do his advice surgeries, as Tony Blair did. What I'm saying is there is a lack of good faith 
and generosity about understanding that all of us come to this with good faith. And we most, you know, of course there are some idiots. Of course there are some people who are in it for themselves and the ego gets a bit big. A bit big. But my experience, whether it's local councillors in communities or whether it's national politicians, you do need an element of good faith required. Okay. Hang on. But, but the missing ingredient in this time is courage. Courage. And courage sometimes to break out of the paradigm in which I think there's probably consensus in this room, and that's why there are questions about inequality and other things, that, they're, that they're the courage to break out of a system that we've been in for the last few years. But entrenched systems in inequality, is yeah. generosity the answer to those? No. I, I was talking to um, a journalist recently who said that he thought that um, journalists had made a mistake about the decline of the Church of England. Uh, not that it wasn't declining, he thought it was, but the reasons for that. And what he said was that journalists look at ch people going to church and they say, oh, you know, the Church of England is obviously going to hell in a handcart, it's declining, nobody's interested. And they take that as, uh, one of the reasons for that is disinterest in matters of faith. And that that was a mistake, that in fact what we're seeing is a disinclination to join things and a disinclination to be part of institutions, but that interest and energy around the really big questions of life, about life and death, about faith, whether, it, whether there is a God, about the future of the planet, what happens to us when we die, uh, you know, what is love, how do, I be, how do I become more trusting, all of those big issues are, very, are still very live and very interesting for people. And I think that there's something similar happening in, in politics. There's an assumption at the centre of our politics and our political system that um, the adversarial nature of politics is the best way to arrive at the truth or the best way to arrive at a vision for the future. And it's one way to arrive at a vision for the future, to put one side, another side, and perhaps find a compromise. And there's a really important assumption at the centre of that, that that's the only way and our church, as I'm sure other institutions, are involved with uh, an organisation called Citizens, London Citizens, mm -hmm. which is a grassroots organisation which is trying to say politics can be done differently. So to, to understand what are the issues that actually affect people really in their daily lives and then put that agenda to professional politicians and, and demand that they take those kinds of issues seriously which is not necessarily an adversarial way of going about things. So there's a generosity, there's a gener generosity of spirit, I think, which is, to be fair to politicians and those in public life, an exhausting level of certainty is demanded from them all the time. And the news agenda goes on and on, and as soon as one sentence is out of their mouths, the journalist uh, uh, is trying to get the next part of the story out of them. And so that pace, means that uh, I think politicians, as other people in public life, are often trapped in um, uh, a kind of ener energetic um, uh, trajectory which doesn't help people in their everyday lives. And it becomes a, it becomes a kind of trading of sound bites and it becomes a, a shouting match. So I'm challenging the assumption that the adversarial nature of our politics is the best way or the only way of arriving at a vision for the future. There are other ways, and Citizens is one of those organisations which is trying to do it differently. Uh, David mentioned courage, mm. and you've brought uh, the church into this. There's a question here. How do we practically develop the courage to be generous? Is it through faith or secular ways? Can faith and secularism go hand in hand to develop the courage personally and collectively? Cool. Would you like to... Yes, I think one of the issues for people of faith, particularly in the church, uh, around the issue of courage, is that we haven't, we haven't learned to disagree well. And so what we do is uh, disagree badly, and we become afraid of saying what we think because of uh, disapproval or because of uh, the, the other point of view, whatever that is. And that does seem to me a real problem. There's, you know, fear and courage are often 
two sides of the same coin and uh, being fearful one moment can lead to saying something courageous the next. It's harnessing the fear of being disapproved of or the fear of being argued with or the fear of being called wrong, harnessing that fear and transforming it into courage, I think is one of the, is one of the spiritual disciplines, if you like, that, uh, that Christianity and other faiths can offer. Hmm. David, on courage, how do you develop that? Hmm. Well, I think it, you know, there, are some, there are some moments where it's kind of inevitable. Um, and I think that, as I sort of said, for a younger generation who are getting such a different deal to their parents' generation, it's inevitable that politicians will have to find the courage somewhere to respond to that or we'll get turfed out of office. We have a coalition at the moment because the British people looked at the politicians and said a plague on all their houses. Let's see where we get to in the next general election. We may end up with another coalition. So in a sense, whether we like it or not, we will have to respond. And you get these massive corrections. In a sense, when I go into Parliament, I think there are 144 new MPs across the House that came in as a result of the expenses scandal. That's a huge new breath of fresh air coming through the political parties. Um, and some of them are, you know, that, that you, you're only beginning to see their faces because obviously they're only new as of 2010. So um, courage, I think, is coming. And all representatives have to be responsive to their people or the system doesn't work and feels broken. And, 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 and you get to revolution. None of us want revolution, but that's what you get. Question. Who has just come through? Who in the public eye is really showing us, as citizens, how generosity can be demonstrated? So we're talking about courage. But who, who is now showing us how it can be demonstrated? And what do you think uh, is required to create the conditions where generosity is more enmeshed in society? So who is showing us how this hmm. is plausible? I'm sure, I'm sure that the people here would have uh, better ideas than me. For some, for some reason, there is, uh, she's, she's no longer alive, but somebody who died not long ago was Anita Roddick. And she seemed to me to be a person who uh, embodied a different way of doing things, the founder of the body shop, of course, a different way of doing things, a values-led business that employed a large number of people, but also when she knew that she was um, coming towards the end of her life, was very clear about giving away a lot of her wealth, which was very considerable. So sometimes there are, there are people, there are individuals who are in very difficult circumstances as she was, who demonstrated that, uh, that kind of generosity that I think is transformative and transformative across institutions. I don't think we should underestimate what, uh, what effect individuals can have. That there can be one or two people who can transform um, wider groups and, and, and institutions. And I think she was certainly one of them. Mm, David. My experience, it, it, it makes me return to public services. I am always hugely touched by nurses, particularly working in the NHS. I, I think the people that work in our hospices are just wonderful. I think people who are working in charity shops, I, I think teachers who stay behind after school, um, uh, youth workers running uh, after school clubs and activities, often with no funding, go to so many of our parks, not, not necessarily the big, the, big, the big ones, but just parks in local authorities, look on a Saturday and a Sunday, look at the sport, look at the, look at the men and women leading that activity. So they're giving of their time. What worries me is a society, and this is where the political class is not just about politicians, it's about the media and other public service servants, do not want to show that. The news never covers those great stories. It never supports those people. It almost runs them down. Um, it, in, it, this morning, we get a discussion of Sharon Shoesmith and social workers 
And again, not wanting to get into the particulars of that case, social workers, why would you want to be one? Why would you want to be one? In, with the blame culture that exists in our society, these are great, often women, doing their best, most often with the very poorest, and trying to help young people, trying to help families get back on the straight, on the straight track. So lots and lots of examples of generosity in action, but a society that seems not to want to encourage, support, put a focus, and create an environment in which we celebrate this, is what I see. How do we, says somebody, how do we reverse the growing generation of believing the right to have what they want without earning it? Surely this will slowly kill off generosity as we know it. Slightly uh, fixed also to, the, to that theme, how can one be so generous if you suspect your generosity may be at risk of being taken advantage of? There's a ri that, the second question, that's, that goes to the nub of what it often feels like to want to be generous as an individual, but to worry that you're being taken for a ride. And it, I go back to the, the quotation that I ended my introductory remarks with. Um, what will happen to me if I help this person? Will I feel foolish? Will I believe that I have been taken for a ride? Will I be late for my next appointment? Will I put myself in danger? All of those things are quite legitimate questions to ask, but perhaps they could be asked after the primary question, which is what happens to this person if I don't act generously towards them? And the answer may be nothing, or the answer may be something quite serious. So I, I suppose what I would say is that, picking up on David's theme of patience and steadfastness, this isn't about um, doing one act, one generous act a day and then relaxing so that we can all take part in our you know, unjust and abusive systems the rest of the time. It is about cultivating, cultivating a spirit of generosity which is patient, which is steadfast, which is all day, every day. And that's, again, it's not, a, it's not to engender anxiety or guilt. That is, that is a, a vision of how human life could be. And I, I would not be doing the work that I'm doing, I would not be in the role that I am if I didn't really believe that that was possible in community, together, to live in that way. Isabel Archer in Henry James's Portrait of a Lady says, never regret a generous error. Right. So the worst thing in the world is not to make a mistake. If I've made a yep. mistake... Okay, and we are te we're terribly hypocritical about this as well because we'll walk past the guy on the street and say, well, I won't give him money because he'll spend it on drink. Oh, must get a bottle of wine for dinner. Mm. I mean, it's, it's a classic double think. And, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a, an aspect of that generosity which I think is um, just to shine a light on our own anxiety about getting it right. It's not about getting it right. It's about living in a slightly profligate way, um, in, in a generous way, and understanding that you can't give yourself away unless you know the self that you have to give. What about this having the, you know, the right to have what you want without earning it? Is that killing off generosity? Is that a culture you recognise? Well, I, I think that um, if, if, if many in the audience agree that we have been in an age of mass consumption, then clearly, as a result of that, there is a sense of entitlement to stuff. <laughs> and sometimes it's stuff you don't really need. Um, and so you have to return to what do we really mean by earned? Uh, and there, I think, we, we, there is actually a discussion going on. So um, one of the things that's really important in, in the schools I go into, working in communities like mine, it, it is to get across what real value means. And real value means often constant application over a period of time to, 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 to be good at something. Um, and often when no one's looking, practice to be good at something. Uh, it's not the X factor. <laughs> mm. 
it's, you know, thank God we've exported Simon Cowell to the United States. Uh, I, I, I think labor, quiet, craft, the old understandings. Uh, I, I, I was speaking in, in, in Parliament a few days ago about apprenticeships. Apprenticeships. You know, St. Paul was, a, was an apprentice. He, I think he, he was a leather maker. You know, you, someone takes you under their wing, you learn your craft over many, many, many years, and you become brilliant at it, and you, 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 know, you continue doing it. Well, I don't think some of what's passing for an apprenticeship in our you know, six-week customer service is, is, is an apprenticeship. And I think we make a big mistake if we dress it up and label it like that. And actually, young people themselves, they know that they're being sold short. So it's what is earned. It, it's what is of value. It's also about intrinsic value. This gets you into the arts and the sorts of people that crafted for so long to create the beauty in this great cathedral, as well as instrumental value and reasserting those age-old truths, it seems to me. This question come in, and uh, the person is specifically directing it at David, but I, I'd like to uh, hear Lucy on it as well. You spoke of the rights and freedom revolutions, although another person has said, will there ever be freedom for human beings? But you spoke of the rights and freedom revolutions. Where in the context... Where in the context of generosity is the place for the duties revolution? Okay, thank you. Okay, I think, I, okay, okay, I'll do my best. The, Thank you, sir. The We've of heard this, the question, and the, now the, we must the, allow the, people the, to answer the, it. The, the, the essence of this, it seems to me, is in part philosophical. It's this idea that we're born, that we're born free, that we're born equal, and it's pushing that a bit and saying, actually, we're born dependent on our parents. In life, we're dependent on our neighbours, on our teachers, on the people we work with, and we get to community. We're not islands in of ourselves, it seems to me. And if you, if you understand that, then you, then you, can, you get to obligation and duty and responsibility. If we have gone too far on what is individualism, whether that is the market individualism of our economy, or whether that is the sense that it's me, myself, and I, and my right, and not yours, or not us, not we, not how we come together, then I think we start to lose touch with obligation. And, and that's, that's why, and people will do this in different ways, but the business of coming together like we are tonight in this church on a, I forgot what day of the week we're on, what day? Tuesday. On a Tuesday, on a Tuesday evening when we could all be at home doing something different. Different backgrounds, different people, different stories, but in some kind of fellowship and fraternity is so special. It's so special. And, and, and how do we generate more of that in different po pockets of community across our, across our country. Because that, it seems to me, is the seed corn of obligation. Not just your family. I don't think you have to be a Christian. You know, um, Arthur Miller wrote a, wrote a great play, All My Sons, and he was an atheist. It's about not just my children, but your children as well. Duties, Lucy. Yes, I, I, I think I go back to um, one of the points I was trying to make, which is that to act generously, one must feel empowered oneself. So it's no, there's no point in us uh, saying to others, um, you have to be more generous, and particularly to others who are simply 
trying to get through the day for whatever reason that might be, for economic reasons or personal reasons. Um, it, it, there's no, it's no good lecturing each other about generosity in the sense that if we know that we are to give ourselves away and that that is a, 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 delight, a delightful and abundant way to live, then we have to know who that person is that we are giving away so that there's a, there is a rights and a duties aspect to this. And the balance, uh, you know, I, I'm glad that we're discussing it tonight. It has, it has gone uh, different ways over hundreds of years about rights and responsibilities, about uh, obviously the discussions at the moment about the welfare state and how generous those uh, benefits are uh, or not and what kind of um, mindset that encourages in a person who is, who is receiving those benefits. All of this, at the crux of that, is this uh, line between uh, I am who I am, take me as I, as I am, this is, uh, I'm not going to compromise. There's a kind of um, an individual, uh, individualistic culture that is, uh, that is encouraged there, at the same time as saying, I am only well when you are well, and if you are not well, I am diminished. To, to get to that point is, uh, it does seem that we're moving away from that, which is, I suppose, I feel very hopeful about the future as a, as a character, but that is where I get depressed or, or down about it, when I see that we're moving away from a sense that your suffering diminishes me, not just you, it diminishes me. And so, therefore, that c capacity to empathize and imagine and compassion, which literally means suffering with, of course, is, is a very important element in this. Thank you. Time's come to an end. I just asked the two speakers before we came out if they could just hear the, the tenor of the questions tonight and, on reflection, give us a thought or two about... Yeah, again, a sort of restlessness in the air about what we can do, how we can train ourselves to be more generous, um, how we can be more anarchic in our generosity. What advice, having heard the questions tonight, have you got for us a thought? As we, you're good for thought for the day. <laughs> we want thought for the evening. <laughs> you know, I've... Um I've, I've, like others here, I will have, I've taken part in a number of these kinds of evenings and debates and sometimes it seems to me that we're all lobbying someone else who's not in the room and sometimes it seems to me that we're, we're trying, we really want to get it right, we've turned up because we want to hear some answers and we're trying to, we're trying to petition uh, someone else who's over there, whether it's the media, the politicians, sometimes it's God, sometimes it's the church, whoever it is. And it does often come back to what can we do? And quite often the speakers from the panel say, well, we're doing it, this is it. You've turned up tonight, well done. And there's, that's quite often the way these conversations go. So I'm not going to say that. Um, I'm, I'm really tempted to quote not a great theologian or a great spiritual leader, but one of my gurus who is Craig Revel Horwood of, from Strictly Come Dancing. There was a moment I don't find any Strictly fans here at all, but it, there was a moment last year where in a, in, a, in a fantastically glitzy and frivolous show that is watched by millions of people and is therefore uh, has more influence than we might think, there was a moment in last year's show where Lewis Smith, who was the gymnast who eventually won the show, um, was dancing really well and he was, he was getting it. The character was coming out and his Paso Doble was, you know, great. But he wasn't he wasn't really getting it. He wasn't really dancing. And Craig Revel Horwood said to him in his inimitable way, you have to learn to give yourself up, darling. Otherwise, you will never learn to dance. And to me, that is something about human living. We have to learn to give ourselves up. Otherwise, we will never learn to dance together. Thank you. David, your thought? I thought that was wonderful. Um, I... I Obviously, for me as a politician, it's about the challenge. I do think that we respond to the people and we need to be pushed to have the courage to answer the big questions. There is generosity happening. Uh, 
as I said, I see it in the food bank movements. I see it in so many public servants, simple acts of generosity every day. I don't see the pot spotlight put on it, and that means that we do have to challenge journalists and others to put a spotlight on these things. So it does matter, you know, writing letters to newspapers, pushing editors. Um, and uh, yes, it, it also means you have to give people like me a hard time. But I think we must do that with a spirit of, of good faith, not bad faith. Not assuming that we come to this somehow in order to do others down. And I think in the wider questions that have come from the floor on inequality, the real debate is about how we support people who, fall, who just because of bad luck fall on hard times. So many of the people that come and see me often in need of a benefit, I have fallen on hard times and it's bad luck. And often if you're poor, and I know this audience will know that, the cushions to get to better luck, your family support, your networks are not there. Having said that, when we invented taxation and the state, the idea that we could pool our resources together to provide that insurance scheme for everybody, for the integrity of that, we have also got to challenge those who are trying their luck. And there is also a bit of trying your luck with the system. So there's a difficult balance with the welfare state to strike. I think we've tipped too far in a certain direction. But recognize that all politicians from all parties are actually trying to navigate that pendulum as they balance between supporting those who fall on hard times and bad luck and, and ensure that there aren't those trying their luck with a collective system that I think was a very, very, very important invention in the last century. Thank you. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, tonight we were reminded uh, by Lucy in her talk about for the person of faith God's gift is our being, and our gift in return is, is our becoming, who we become, and uh, the role of, of generosity in the formation of, of human soul. David's reminded us of how that can be translated into political policies. It strikes me that at the end of the day, what we are recognizing or beginning to recognize here tonight is that in all the things that matter most, in our lives, love and relationship and trust, and I count generosity as one of these. These are the things that they, they increase as they're shared. The more you give um, of these, the more you have. And they're unlike wealth, and they're unlike power, where if I win, you lose. But in all the things that you and I know matter most, the truth is that if you win, I win too. And that seems to be a very important lesson to restate here. Churchill, of course, put it much more succinctly than me. We make a living by what we earn, but we make a life by what we give. And I want to thank on your behalf both Lucy Winkett and David Lammy for beginning a conversation about these terribly important issues. Can I thank them on your behalf?